she's doing a little series of essays that she's writing, uh, and it's a, somewhat in conjunction with her work in the Cancer Journals in 1978, where as she's experiencing this phenomenal and to some extent traumatic experience with cancer, she's deepening her relationship to understanding her body, first of all, not separated from her mind, the falseness of that binary, but recognizing that her body has a certain capacity for knowing that actually surpasses the ideas of knowing that circulate in the world. And as I read Lord later on in, in the manuscript and writing, I think she's actually grappling with a problem that Kant couldn't figure out um, uh, in, in terms of the sublime and sensible. Lordian knowing is a philosophy of aliveness that is epistemo epistemological, meaning it's about the way we know, and it's ontological because it's about what being is. I lean on Lord's ideas then to characterize what I mean by aliveness in a black world, the becoming of beingness, the sensations that inhabits one's body in its existence and that are a source of knowing, the way our bodies think as they feel, which is a quotation from Brian Nasumi. Our bodies think as they feel. I love that. <clears throat> Aliveness as a pulse and pulsing, not only movement, not only discernible action. Aliveness as already here, as conceptualized by activist George Jackson in a letter written, written while imprisoned to his editor. I can't get life, I already have it. I can't get life, I already have it. And just because if you know George Jackson's situation, I don't mean to suggest again that there aren't structures of imprisonment and brutalization that indeed can take away one's social life. But I think it's so profound that in writing from prison, George Jackson articulates a kind of outsideness of the discourse that would to house and totalize his body. I'm writing in this project about relational oneness. As Professor Beavers noted near the end of the last project on quiet, I came to the idea of oneness as a way to start thinking about something that was untouchable in black being. This time, I'm thinking now about relation. If we follow the philosophical tradition of Jewish, um, Jewish scholars like Emmanuel Levinas or Martin Buber, or even that, especially that of Caribbean philosopher Edouard Gossin, we might understand relation as being about recognition of and surrender to the other, to exist in a face-to-face -face encounter of and surrender to the other, to be called into ethical relation in, that, in regard to the other. But I want to shift how we think about relation just slightly since it is not possible, really, to surrender to the other. Indeed, Levinas, Buber, and Glissant, all in their own ways, recognize that true relation is a horizon, an ambition, but not really an achievement. Indeed, the problem of relation for any human being is that in face of its impossibility, we risk co-opting the other through our limited imagination. This is the kind of asymmetry, right, that Levinas talks about. So if you're thinking to yourself, oh, there's an other, and I'm going to be open to them, you've already, you're, you're out of relation. Because you're already conceptualizing and experience that person as beyond you. But there's another problem for the black one in an anti-black world, which is that the world is anti-relational towards the black one. The world only figures her as an object of different, difference upon which relation might be approximated, but never figures her as the one in relation. This is what Horton Spillers call, and uh, Fred Moulton call, being for. And in the larger project, I talk about this as a kind of exemption from the uh, position of oneness. I'm motivated, therefore, to understand relation not as the meeting between two, but as the capacity of the one to be full in the moment of meeting, to conceptualize relationality as a call to be prepared in one's capaciousness, relation as about oneness, not two, 
where the question of how I am and how to be merge as terms of ethical reckoning. In the Cancer Journals, I think it's on page 52, um, Lord has this moment where she says, um, I am who the world and I have never seen before. Right, so this is after pages of her from her journals describing the kind of terror of being in the hospital, um, realizing she's going to lose her breast, trying to, uh, to think about where are all the black women, and particularly black lesbians, who've had this experience. I need to lean on people whose understanding of the thing might come close to my experience. And so she, she's struggling through that. And near the end of a passage, it's like she has this realization. I am who the world and I have never seen before. And what I love about that articulation is that Lord's understanding of her being is so profoundly outside of the ideologies that shape and organize the world that she's not only new to the world, but new to herself. And if we had more time, I would talk about how, um, no disregard to the Bible, which plays a prominent role in my life, and my mother will think of being blasphemous by this next thing I'm about to say. But, you know, when, when God says, if there are Bible scholars here, forgive the way in which I'm they're playing with the Bible, like it's a comic book. Um, when God says to Moses, Moses is like, oh God, why don't you tell me who you are, blah, blah, blah. And God is like, look, I'm going to tell you one time. I am that I am. Right? Lord takes that statement of imminence and transcendence and flip, like ups the ante on it. I am who, uh, who the world first and I have never seen before. And so I'm trying to think about what does it mean in, in, in black women's literature especially. There's so many articulations of that sense of being like exempted from human beingness such that you become the exceptional human being, right? So Nikki Giovanni's ego tripping where she says, like, I'm so hip, even my errors are correct, right? Um, uh, uh, Jamila Woods' song, Holy, um, I, am ho ho I am holy on my own. And Tazaki Shange saying, I found God, I found God in myself, and I loved her fiercely. And over and over again in, in black women's literary practice, we see this, uh, this articulation of a being that, that rises in oneness. And I want to argue that that oneness, my girl Sula, that book that if anybody has questions about Sula, they can only be questions about how much you love that book. Cause you will not. <laughs> I'm an academic. I believe you could ask any question. You can't critique Sula, the book, or the character, because we will go come to blows. Um, <laughs> that character, Sula, who isn't, people misunderstand Sula's ethical. They think, indeed, Sula doesn't think about other people. But Sula moves through the world thinking, I'm a full being. And I believe every person I encounter will think of themselves, too, that they are a full being. That's, that's relation, right? Relation isn't, oh, she slept with her best friend's husband. I mean, we can talk about that, because Jude wasn't all that interested anyway. But um, I'm going to get back to the talk so I can finish up so we can have a conversation. Um, in this project, I'm thinking about oneness and about the ways in which being exempted from oneness which is the philosophical position, right? Every philosopher sits down to write from their own experience, but writes of a one, right? Writes of this kind of capacious pronoun. That's a, it's the most human pronoun that there is. I'm motivated, therefore, to understand relation not as a meeting of the two, but as a capacity of the one. Where blackness figures only as negation or antagonism or death or resistance, where blackness exists only as these, there's an ethical injunction. Specifically, in an anti-black world where blackness constitutes non-being, the black subject is essentially non-relational. In an anti-black world, there is no ethical possibility for the one who's black. There is no figuring through one's humanity because one's humanity is not. If the ethical depends on one's instantiation as a one, Anti-blackness permits only a limited in instantiation, for as James Baldwin reminds us, the American triumph 
in which the American tragedy has always been implicit was to make black people despise themselves. We are supposed to hate ourselves, which is no <coughs> instantiation at all. My argument then uses the black world of aesthetics to imagine that a black one might be able to be in a relation of rightness and therefore might be called to heed the common question, the most human and most important question, how to be. A question which is not in regard to how to be to the other, but which instead stands as an invitation to study through one's existence. I'm going to close with like, two more paragraphs. Um, but before I say this, in the project, as I think about this question, how to be, I think about how dangerous that question is in an anti-black world, right? Where so often what's being articulated is, if you act a certain way, then you are legitimate then you'll be treated right. And so I don't mean the question how to be as some kind of imperative, um, as if one's worth can be legislated. To, to be able to ask the question how to be, one has to believe first that you are of worth, and then you have to believe that every day you have to get up and figure out how to earn that worth. And that paradox is really hard to sustain in a culture that thinks you're worthless. Mm -hmm. But it is still a thing one has to do. And it's a, it's a paradox and a balance I'm trying to struggle through. Oh, I said that I return to um, Lord a lot. Indeed, I also return to Miss Clifton. We can come, in closing, we can come back to Miss Clifton to read Reply for us to read its aesthetics of distance as an integer of black inhabiting, to read its speaker's beholding as a roll call, if, in the subjunctive, we consider this poem as being for a black us, then its ethical imperative becomes clear. It says, this is how you are, this is how you can be. This is black aliveness where the question how to be is possible, is open and wondrous and terrifying too, where this mighty, humble question is indexed to one's breathing, where there is grace in bearing the question every miserable day, the rigor in beholding, truly beholding one's humanity. Black aliveness, which calls the black one to be of her abundance and smallness, her imminence and transcendence, black aliveness which says, do not think only of your deprivation, though deprivation surely is yours. Be of humility and of grandeur too. All of this is your aliveness. All of this is of the invitation to study, to study regardless of the things of the world, to study because you are black and alive and human. Thank you. I'd love to take questions about Sula. I'd love to hear how much you love that book, that character. Um, no, I'd love to take any questions or comments um, or suggestions that people have. Yeah. Since, since I, I think about this all the time, can you can can you talk about that moment in the in the bottom um, mm. after Sula dies? Mm and the people in the bottom decide to go to destroy the tunnel. Mm. Um, is, is that, um, is the, are the deaths that result from that act the, the, um, um, the product of them being stripped of the model of relationality that mm. Suma mm. offers them, which they're not willing to accept, but which he offers them nonetheless? I think so, and I think indeed the figure of relationality who moves through the book before Sula is Shadrach. Mm -hmm. So there's Shadrach at the beginning. If you know the novel, Shadrach has been to war and has come back and is just decimated by war in the way that wars always decimate people who fight them. And he's, um, he's in jail because he's having, his body is not responding as he's having post-traumatic stress disorder, um, not to categorize uh, uh, people. Um, and he's looking, he grabs a towel and looks in the toilet bowl because he wants to just see himself. And Morrison, who's 
right? I mean, what Morrison does with language is, is a whole other thing. But Morrison describes him looking in the toilet water and seeing a blackness so indisputable, he wanted nothing more. Right? That's nearly verbatim what it says. And so Shadrach looks in a toilet bowl, like a place of abjection, humble place, and finds a blackness his, so indisputable, his body, all of a sudden, is back to being his. And so Shadrach starts National Suicide Day to tell people, look, all of the difficulty we have in our life comes from being afraid of death. Like, you can track it to that. Mm -hmm. So if we have a day where we can celebrate death and be like, hey, I'm not afraid of you, we can actually then have the rest of the year where we can practice being of our better selves rather than being of that mm -hmm withholding self that I think the fear of death um, uh, embodies in, in us. And the people always ignore it. They think he's, cr you know, they think he's crazy, etc. Um, and so when Sula dies, they go, they go on this parade, but they go out of their frustration, not out of right. an opening. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's a great, that's a great, um, uh, it, it's inspiring to me that you, pick up that that recognition of that scene in from the things I'm talking about here. Yeah. Are there other questions? Yes. Yeah, I love the talk so much. I love this new focus on aliveness. Thank you. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm I'm so struck when you said the course, you know, for many of us, you know, we're going to think, okay, what is Kevin opening up in terms of everything we want to say about our focus mm -hmm. And so I'm I'm drawn to so many ways that I actually think of all the layers that pull me, and that's the part that really enchants me because I think so often, even when a lot of Afro peasants, but they're saying, okay, what we really mean when we talk about social death is we mean life in spite of the social death. Even though they say that, I don't believe it always. <laughs> actually, what we need, right, is actually your very theory of aliveness, and then. Because I'm trying to even think about the slide where you had, you know, we told us, you know, I had more time. I would think about sex, I would think about Charlie, I would think about so many people in that camp, you know, for better or worse, the people who use that sort of frame, mm -hmm. Afro pessimism, and the people who are sort of pulled in. You know, think about Spillers when she's like, no, stop. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, right? <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. but here's what I'm getting at. So even when you think about someone like Sharp, like Christina Sharp, and, you know, something I've been working on, I'm, I'm, critiquing the very way when Christina Sharp talks about the climate mm. as being anti-black, right? Yeah. We are naturalizing, yeah. right? Clearly, think about weather. She says it's yeah. the weather, right? Yeah. We are literally yeah. naturalizing the anti-blackness in a way there yeah. that I think cancels out some of the very ways in which she herself, in the passage that you have, right? Yes. Where she's formed around yes. aliveness. Yes. So then yes. I want to say, okay, Sharp, but yeah. stick with the aliveness. You know, don't decide, you know, okay, then if there's other frame mm -hmm. in the same book, right? Yeah. But actually, I'm actually making my readers forget that aliveness. So I mm -hmm. guess if there's a question here, it's even, yeah, even thinking about something like Sharp and what she does with the weather, that sense of the, mm. the weather would be anti-blackness. I'm wondering, could you say more about the ways in which you are trying to engage mm. with both sort of the um, possibilities, you know, what's opened up by Afro-pessimism, and then those limits, you know, mm -hmm. what has actually been shut down mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, clearly some of the problems of their constant use of Orlando Patterson's right social death, right? Clearly that. And then also, you know, just the ways in which in terms of, I mean, you know, Kevin, there's so much I could say here, the way that they're talking about that psychic hold of slavery, mm -hmm. right? And then the way in which that is both generative and then not, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't know, whatever you might want to do with it. Well, I, you know, I, there's a lot I might want to do with that. I think, one of the things black, one of the gifts black pessimism has given to me, and I think to many of us, is that um, made clear the fissure in enlightenment imagination of what life is, right? And disrupting that ideological understanding of life in that particular way. And for me, that I think of the Afro pessimist or black pessimist, or right, that they they are trying to imagine a world by 
trying to locate clearly the world that is not theirs, right? I think there's almost like a, um, it's like a refractory process that's happening. But I think you're right about some of the limits, right? That even Sharp, uh, Sharp is trying to say, I want to talk about the life. And I, I'm trying to find a, a quote from Stephen Best that I think does better. Um, I cut a part of the text. Hortense Spillers gave, I had an interview with Andrew Seal um, recently in um, Difference, and, and Spiller said, you know, I have to believe that if we are, if we are here and we're reading, we have a chance. And I, I, like, I'm in this body, I'm here in this room, I'm in this room with people who, who are responding to things I'm saying. I, we are in a room that's an institutional space. But we're also here in a way that, that suffuses past the institutional space. And I, I think, you know, I think about Miss Brooks, who, I mean, I didn't know Miss Brooks except for one small interaction, Gwendolyn Brooks, but I think about, like, every day, Gwendolyn Brooks getting up and thinking, my job is to whittle away at some poems, right? Like, I, I have a wayward husband I sometimes have to figure out what to do with, and I might have to go down to the local school and speak to some young people or go get some <coughs> award, but every day I'm whittling away at this poem. That's a life, and that's not disregardable. So I think about Sadia Hartman's new work where she's indeed trying to think about beautiful wayward lives, a book that's coming out in, in February, and trying to recognize that at the end of Venus in Two Acts, Hartman basically says, so we have to face the <coughs> failure. Like if we're going to go down the path of saying the archive has no capacity for blackness, then that becomes a dead end. I think we misread the end of Venus in two acts. We misread Hartman's almost saying, like, okay, this is it. This is this is the logical limit of this thing. What next? And so, um, and I think these things happen in cycles. You know, I think um, Stephen Best has a great quotation where he says, in our relationship to thinking about slavery, like, we, we what we do is we create a, a time impossibility, so we can't even imagine our now. Right, because because we are imagining and reimagining slavery in a way that those of us who are here didn't experience it. And Best is not, he's not being anti the move. He makes a difference between the work that Beloved does and the work that a mercy does. That a mercy <coughs> could imagine a world still possibly open. And um, so I think, yeah, I think that, I think we're at a, a moment where black scholars I think should be called to ask other questions. Because I also think that the over iteration of death feels to me like it doesn't attend to the fact that there is life. Yeah. Like it doesn't attend to the fact that what, what we do when we study is we're trying to go to an archive or go to a literary text or go, go into a city and interview people to try to understand a little better how to do this thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I don't have been better than that. Maybe one more question? Before the, this mic feels like it wants to <laughs> screech, I'm so <laughs> trying to be good. Yes? Um, so, this might be a huge departure from everything else. Uh, for context, never taken an English class before, not from the state, so a lot of this is super abstract to me. Mm. Uh, could you like maybe uh, give some sort of practical analog of how to conceptualize what you just mm. explained, like something in the real world that might make this a little less difficult to grasp? Mm. I can, I'll give you a real world example. I know you all are recording this, and so I want to be careful about um, I'm going to just put back up Lucille Clifton's poem just because. So I'm going to step aside of the question for a minute and say, like, this is a real world thing to me, right? That the, the beginning of it where someone asks what seems like a question that actually turns out to be a question that already has its answer embedded in it. And then for Clifton, a poet, black woman poet, to write a poem that Many of us would bypass this poem because we wouldn't think there's anything dynamic there. And to then start to figure out how that dynamism can be there. And in doing that, to recognize, oh, 
a person wrote this poem, and these dynamics came of that person as they were imagining the people that they were writing about. And all those things point to an inevitable, um, indisputable aliveness. Right? So I, that's one response I would say. Like this is a real, this is a because these aren't all positive words necessarily, but this is a real world conceptualization of black being. I think. But I will give you an example that's maybe a little bit too personal. Um, last Saturday, uh, I'm new to Brown. Uh, it's my first semester there. And as sometimes happens when black folks show up in a place, all of a sudden I'm doing lots of things in this new place. And so I was giving a talk at Family Weekend. And it wasn't this talk, because I knew I needed to be thoughtful about audience and so on. Um, but I talked about this poem, because I love this poem so much. And uh, I, I'm realizing after the talk, uh, there were two questions, meant more than two questions, but there were two that stood out. One was from someone in the audience who asked a kind of question about phenomenology or something. Um, and then the second question this person asked, said, the person said, this question is really personal, but I wonder how, if you could talk about how one survives in the brutal world that it is for black people. Mm -hmm. And so I said, do you mean one, like the philosophical one, <laughs> or do you mean one me? And the person said, big auditorium, right? The people, the person, no, no, I mean you. <laughs> and, and so um, I, I had enough presence of mind to say, that feels like an incredibly personal question. Then I said, my work as a human being isn't only surviving the brutality of the world. My work as a human being is being a human being. Um, more questions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, last, the final question was a person. And, and if I'm going to be try to be a relation, I also believe that every person who's asking the question or but every person is trying to do the best they can. I think that um, explanation doesn't apply to people who have institutional power, right? So the president of an institution or a country has a responsibility to actually step outside of relationality and to be of responsibility. They're different. Mm -hmm. um, but the, so I don't mean this as a critique of this person. The very last question was a white woman raised her hand and said, but don't you think finally that these last three lines, they do, they do, they do, that it represents weariness and tiredness from the burden. And I, and I, so, you know, in my best teacherly moment, I said, well, I think there are ways in which one can read the poem in many ways. And I, if we had more time, I would invite you to make that argument and see if, it, if, if I find it compelling. But I don't think the word do is necessarily a word of burden. So that there is something, there is something in the way in which when we think black person or black being, it already comes imbued with things and a responsibility for. You know, I, I hardly ever talk about the last election just because I study and teach. But when that election <laughs> happened, <laughs> I'm sure there are lots of black people in the room. So th there were there were funny instances of people I barely knew or didn't know who needed to look sad toward me about the election so that I could somehow confirm whatever it is they needed to feel. And there were days I was thinking, there's a new vegan ice cream shop down the street. I'm allergic to dairy. I'm going to get vegan ice cream. And yet people were approaching me and saying, the election was about racism. It's so terrible. I'm thinking, I'm on my way to get ice cream. I'm going to go get ice cream. And I don't mean political naivete. I don't mean, of course, of course. Like, I'm heartbroken still. I'm worried now as borders and gender becomes the site of trying to animate, right? animate a, a political force. What I mean is the word do is not a word of burden. It's just a word. 
And if it can't just be a word because it's attached to black bean, then we got real problems. And I think that's the real world, right? That for me, if you're a sociologist, if you're a doctor, if you're a physicist, if you're a literary studies person, a historian, if you're the person who works at CBS, all of us are called to, to try to imagine the thing that the world tells us is not there or is not possible. That black people are of, in and of themselves, a rightness of being. Not a rightness of black being, a rightness of being. And I think that's, um, yeah, I mean, I feel like I've talked myself in a circle, but that's all I have. Um, last question, yes. Um, could you speak briefly on the madness that's going on in the European community? They raised the question, mm. and I'm the person to raise the question that people of color don't cry. Mm. In this poem, and the last remark that you made about the white woman who couldn't get that they do, they do, was referring back to everything that's did. They live, they love, they yeah, cry, yeah. Yeah, yeah. they tire, they flee, they fight, they bleed, they break, they moan, they mourn, they weep. Yeah. Can you do a justification of that? Mm. I, I, I could try, although I think you've already, right? The, I mean, I think one of the things I love about this poem, and, and if, I, if I'm not hearing your question right, then ask me again. I, even as you read it in your own cadence, this poem, if you speak it, makes you fall into a voice and a rhythm. They do, she, he do, she do. They live, they love. That, that's, part of its, that's part of its doing, too. So I, uh, um, other than saying the, the project of modernity and coloniality so inhabited our mind that it's hard to get out from under the idea that the word black appends and somehow makes exceptional ordinary duty. And I think that's, um, I, yeah, I love that this poem has no markers of racial blackness because when a black person is doing they're just a person doing too and that doing is powerful so maybe if i didn't understand the specificity of the well, question i understood it because you pointed out what the issue that we're dealing with is that the other folks think that we're aliens or something mm. yeah so we don't have yeah. these events going on in our life and circumstances yeah it's, a, it's the call to relation. This is why I go to Glissant, right? That relation has to also belong to us. Yeah. Um, the last thing I'll say is, recently I've been thinking about how the call for social justice, such an important call, in, at least in the United States, the call for social justice always, at best, it positions people who are black as outside of that call, mm -hmm. meaning that that you are the ones for whom justice might happen or might not happen. I'm sorry. This is what happened with me. I just got a smartphone in June and now it's doing something and so I'm just <laughs> going to ignore it. That the call for social justice doesn't imagine that a black one 